By one definition, neighborhood business centers are a public platform where you can feel at home. That's one reason why they're a prime location for public art. The nonprofit incubator now and there is taking that to another level in Grove Hall with a combination of murals and mentoring with an eye toward growth for local artists and local businesses. To tell us about the project are the executive director of the Greater Grove Hall Main Streets at Gaskin and one of the artists creating the first mural going up next week, Larry Pierce. So I'd like to thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I, I want to start with, with Ed, Ed Gaskin because it, it's not new having public art by community artists uh, in parts of you know Dorchester, Roxbury, but uh, what's special about what you're trying to do here in Grove Hall? Okay, uh, I'll answer a couple of things very quickly for the viewers. So I actually went to uh, an event that talked about the relationship between economic development and uh, public art. And uh, I then looked at the Boston's, Boston Architectural Commission, which had a plot of all of the uh, public art in the city of Boston. And so there was these hundreds of red dots <laughs> downtown Boston around the metro area. And I had like one red dot, meaning I had one piece of public art in the uh, Greater Grove Hall area. And that was a painted utility box. And so, uh, so that so that was like the city's investment in public art in my neighborhood was three hundred dollars. So I felt that um, I needed to try to do more, and so I began to start. You know, there's a, some of the murals that people have probably seen now, like on Quincy Street, Blue Avenue, Geneva Avenue, whatever. Uh, so I got the utility boxes. Larry was part of that program. And some of the murals, and I kept finding, looking for opportunities to do more um, public art. So that was the first thing. But what, when I was talking to artists like Larry, they were explaining to me that they don't get the same opportunities as their white counterparts in doing commissioned artwork, responding to RFPs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, foundations. And I said, okay. And then I had another friend, Archie LaSalle, who was pointing out, for instance. As he's a photographer that it's the same problem there so there might be 400,000 pieces like in the Kodak Museum and I don't know there's like 14,000 phot photographs from African American artists so the idea was what can we do to try to find more avenues or opportunities for artists of color and um, this was another one where I got the idea just like when you see billboard advertisements what would happen if we were able to do the ad like the artwork like we do ads and then swap them out on a regular basis so yeah. the, the advantage would be it would cost us less money to do it it would allow us to uh show work from people who aren't muralists like let's say like larry or whatever who don't want to do a big mural but would, would have existing artwork their photographers their watercolors and things like that and so collectively this project was designed to solve several different types of problems and because instead of doing a mural that's permanent and it's temporary, it means that we can swap out the artwork and get and let more artists of color have an opportunity to show their work to the public. Well, I want to ask you about that. What this means is an opportunity for artists, especially artists of color, because what Ed was saying reminded me a lot about the racial gap in you know money spent on city contracts. Is this pretty much the same phenomenon for, for you? That's one aspect of it. So if you think of this with the city contract, that you know, was like four tenths of 1%. Right, so the city demonstrated that it hasn't been able to get an ability to buy goods and services from blacks, people of color, in that case, blacks. Um, and it's the same thing in the art world. So therefore the same wealth gap that you see overall between the white and black community, you see the same thing in the arts community. And so even though uh, the last mayor increased the money that was spent on arts, he made a cabinet level position in terms of arts and culture, that didn't really translate down into the black artist community of which we're trying to advocate for. Larry, what's it been like for you getting access to, I guess what we used to think of as, you know, just commissions? Um, it's been hit and miss, you know, I've been at it for about maybe 15 years now, but uh, I, I just want to, uh, I just want to um, basically agree with Ed Gaskin. I've always believed in the in the in the uh, interchangeability of murals. For instance, I think that they they should be able to swap out a mural uh, so that another artist gets an opportunity to show his work in the same space. And uh, I, working with the uh, Echo Homes, I have uh, about six of my paintings up. Um, 
on the fence facing uh, Siva Street uh, uh, with um, Roxbury Community College. And this is, I think, the same material that we're going to use to do the mural uh, on Blue Hill Avenue. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a um, weatherproof kind of vinyl material. This, uh, and and um, it's going to be wall sized. And the good thing about it is we're the first artists going up. But after a certain amount of time, we come down and another artist has an opportunity to go up in the same space. You, you know, when Ed was describing a lack of public art in Grove Hall, it's almost as if there were no there there. You put this mural up next week, somebody comes into Grove Hall, looks at it on the side of the building where the laundry is. Uh, what's, what's it going to look like then? Well, just to, to respond to your first point, uh, Barry Gaither described uh, Grove Hall as a public arts desert, <laughs> to referring to the fact that I had like one public art. And um, and so, it, but hopefully uh, the same kind of thing, when people used to drive down Blue Hill Avenue and they saw um, Rob Gibbs pro-black, his mural, Breathe Life, um, and you know, that became a national award-winning uh, uh, mural. So now we have a mural on the other side of the, of the of the street, so for people who are driving into Grove Hall, uh, ideally, besides um, this this art infrastructure here, uh, I would like to be able to use more of the walls that I have in Grove Hall to do more artwork. I, that's just it, it, my only barrier there is I don't actually have the money to do that, but I envision doing a lot more of this. Yeah, Larry, walk us through this a bit because once this is up in the building um, and. There's, there's your contribution and there's Paul Goodnight's contribution. How's it going to strike people? I think they're going to really be appreciative of the fact of the, the aesthetic, you know, um, that we're, we're, we're enhancing the neighborhood with really beautiful art and we're also doing an educational thing. In other words, Paul's, Paul's original vision was to, um, to inform people about, for instance, the banjo, which is an, which is an instrument that was originally imported to this country from Africa. A lot of people don't realize that. It's not from Dixie, it's actually from Nigeria or wherever. So I think that um, we're, we're enhancing the, the uh, cultural aspect of the neighborhoods. Uh, and you know, I don't want to give the, the false impression that I think only removable murals are valid because there's an artist, uh, and I haven't met him, but I saw him working. His name is Marka 27, and he has a mural that he just completed on Blue Hill Avenue and, and uh, Stanwood Street. And this is a permanent mural um, on the wall. And it's, uh, it's something, it's, I mean, it's so well done that it's something that I, I imagine could last for years and still be aesthetically pleasing. Well, you, you don't need a degree in art history to know the feeling of seeing something and recognizing that it's art, it's something that's in a frame or, or, or it's on this plane on the side of a building. And when people in Grove Hall look at what you are created with, with Paul uh, Goodnight and they see something of their background in that frame, what does that do for them? Well, I can just tell you the response that we had with the um, utility boxes, the painted utility boxes that I mentioned earlier. And um, uh, Larry, for instance, did some, he took the utility boxes and he painted them like the Nation of Islam figures uh, going into the mosque, the Muhammad's Mosque number 11. And um, I just remember when people saw like the Prince ones and some other ones, people were pulling over, some people were in tears. They're like, we never get anything good in this neighborhood. They were just so excited that we actually had art in the community. And I thought to myself, oh my God, something that small is having that kind of an impact. We had yeah. a Muhammad Ali one right in front of a barbershop and the, the, the owner said, my guys love it. They come here, they talk about Ali, they, as they're waiting for their haircut. And so, and there's, a, there's some Tupac ones in the neighborhood as well. And so you, you, you. I was surprised at the as, at the reaction and the embrace, the fact that we've been able to do this and how people have responded to it. Larry Pierce, what does that reaction do for you? Oh, it's 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 wonderful and it's very very ingratiating. As a matter of fact, uh, it reminds me of a gallery that uh, that we created, a tiny gallery on um, on. Um, Blue Hill Avenue, right across from uh, Hibernia Hall. 
Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we, we had a dispute with the landlord. So the gallery only lasted two weeks. But during the opening, it was standing room only. It was people from the neighborhood came and just flooded the place. And when we had to close the gallery, I got so many uh, expressions of, of remorse. You know, they were saying we had, we had this in our neighborhood, what happened to it? So it just reinforced the fact that people are hungry for art and really appreciative of the fact that when you do something like this, um, they benefit from it. Well, right, Chris, I, I, I know you've probably done, in addition to a lot of teaching, maybe even some mentoring as well, but what was it like working with Paul Goodnight on this? Paul is my mentor. Paul is an extraordinary uh, internationally recognized artist. And um, when he invited me in, I was, I was honored to be a part of this. I was a little nervous. I didn't know that I would be able to uh, live up to that standard. But uh, yeah, I was very, very honored to be a part of it. I've worked with Paul. We've, we've given shows together. We've had uh, art shows together. We did a black and white show at the Pagano Gallery. Um, but this is the first time we've actually uh, melded our two styles together in one piece. So um, yeah, I just, uh, I'm really happy that I got a chance to work with Finally, back to Ed Gaskin, uh, there is an unveiling on schedule. So can you tell our audience a little bit about that in case they might want to get a, an early glimpse of this mural <laughs> as it's unveiled? Yes, yeah, so uh, June 16th, uh, 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, I believe it's 435 Blue Hill Avenue. So if you guys know where um, uh, Breeze's laundromat is, it's going to be on the side of the building. So there's uh, now we're there actually paid for and um, did all the stuff to get the art infrastructure in place, and uh, which I'm very appreciative of their contribution uh, to this project. So we're going to have Mayor Janie will be there for the unveiling and um, we will have food and music. And so, uh, as Larry said, everyone likes a party. So why would you miss this one? There you well, go. Uh, right. Thank you both very much for taking the time to share the preview. Sure. There's the artist Larry Pierce and Ed Gaskin from Greater Grove Hall Main Streets. We'll have more news in just a moment.